good afternoon. Uh, I'm Tamandra Hartness. I'm, I'm chairing this session. Uh, and the way it will work, slightly unusual from the, the usual panel debate format, is Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter here. Uh, you don't mind, do you mind if I use all your honours? You don't need do to you? do that. I know, no, I need no. you to annoy you. Anyway, yeah. more importantly, uh, he is the uh, former president of the Royal Statistical Society, of which I'm a member, so uh, you should all go and join that. Uh, he's going to give a short lecture, uh, but he's going to do it sitting down. It's not going to be that lecture-like. Uh, about risk and the art of statistics and what we can learn from statistics. And then we have a, a couple of excellent respondents here who are going to give shorter responses. And then I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and foment a little bit of argument disagreement here. But if we don't manage that, then I'll basically come out to you and rely on you, uh, as you've all been doing so excellently all weekend, to get a bit of, of discussion and debate going. Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter. Uh, is the chair of the, uh, of the Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication at the University of Cambridge, which aims to improve the way that statistical evidence is used by health professionals, patients, lawyers and judges, media and policymakers, uh, but also quite handy for helping the likes of you and me to understand uh, what statistics mean. Uh, is the former president of the Royal Statistical Society, co-author of The Art of Statistics, Learning from Data. Now, you're the author of... I'm the author of You're that. the author of The Art of Statistics, no. Learning, but co-author... Yeah. Well, uh, author of over 200 refereed publications, co-author of six textbooks, as well as co-author of The Norm Chronicles with Michael Blastund, which I really recommend. Uh, it's, it's a very accessible way to start thinking about risk that is not just about numbers, it's also about human beings and the way we think and the way we behave. Also the author of Sex by Numbers, which is an ill-disguised way to get you thinking about statistics by talking a lot about sex. Uh, and the art of statistics, which is not even disguised, but such an accessible way to, to think about statistics. I really wish I'd had it when I scraped my sorry ass through a a degree in maths and statistics. Uh, if, you, if you think he looks familiar, he's also presented the BBC Four documentaries, Tales You Win, The Science of Chance, and the award-winning Climate Change by Numbers. He was elected Fellow of the Royal Society in 2005 and knighted in 2014 for services to medical statistics. Uh, so that's David. But before we hear from him, let me just introduce two people who are going to give us their considered responses. Uh, over there on the far left, we have Dan Enichescu, Head of Public Policy for Europe for Diageo. Diageo, am I saying that right? Diageo. Diageo, I beg your pardon, Diageo PLC. Uh, joined Diageo in 2008, to worked in a variety of corporate relations roles. Before that, worked in the food and drinks industry in Europe and also briefly in the automotive sector. Is an engineer by training with a BSc in mechanical engineering from Bucharest Polytechnic and an MBA from IEC. <coughs> And then in my immediate left, we have Hilary Salt, who is an actuary and the founder of First Actuarial. She advises trustees and employers on pensions and works with trade unions, assisting in collective bargaining situations and advises on pension schemes run by trade unions themselves. Um, disappointingly for me, she apparently is not allowed to give individual pension advice, which means I still don't have a pension. Uh, it's worked extensively with the Communication Workers Union, very topical devising their groundbreaking collective defined contribution proposal, which ended their last dispute with Royal Mail, presumably not the current, not one. The current one. Not the current one. Uh, the independent actuarial advisor to the NHS Pension Schemes Advisory Board and a member of the Policy and Public Affairs Board of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. So, a highly qualified uh, team of speakers. But first of all, understanding risk today, the art of statistics, David, tell oh, us about risk and statistics. Yeah, OK. Well, I, OK, I've gone about 10 minutes or so. It's, I feel very strange because normally when I talk, I'm always standing up, pacing up and down, and always got slides and images and pictures and, and numbers and stuff like that. And I haven't got any of those, so I'm feeling rather exposed, which is why I'm standing, sitting behind this desk to protect myself. Um, this is an incredibly exciting period, I think, for people who are interested in statistics and, you know, quantitative evidence, you know, uh, overall, you know, just numbers. Um, two reasons. First of all, it's the age of data science, the age of data, incredibly important where data has been collected on all of us. And, by all of us, for, for all sorts of reasons, it's being used for, you know, I'm, I won't start going on about that, but, you know, it's, it's just 
an extraordinarily exciting time. And with vast numbers more people going into data analytics and so on. So the training needs are huge. Okay, and the other thing that I think always makes this particularly relevant is we also live in an age of misinformation in which excessive claims are made. We know unreliable claims, untrustworthy claims are being made right, left, and center by people. And a lot of those are numerical. There's a lot of numbers are used. People have caught on to the fact that, you know, everyone likes numbers and claim that there's evidence behind what they're saying we should do. They always say that. Nobody's going to say, oh, I just made this up. But they're always going to say there's evidence. And so this, you know, and a lot of this is not very trustworthy. So it seems to me that, that both of these uh, current trends lead to the need for what could be called data literacy. I, I like the term data literacy because it embodies two things. First of all, at least a minimal ability to do things with data and, you know, more or less in terms of our technical capacity or what work we work in, but crucially a capacity to critique claims based on data. And they're, inter in, you know, they're intimately connected because I think unless we, um, you know, by trying to produce trustworthy analyses, we learn about what's an untrustworthy analysis and how to pull it apart. So I think these are really important things, which I hope we can come back to about you know, how we could improve the education of the public, of the professionals and schools in this area. But I won't talk about that now. And, I, and I'll actually, I will concentrate on risk, although everything I'm going to say just applies to numbers in general, because numbers, so the first thing I want to say is that numbers do not speak for themselves. They're not cold, hard facts that are self-evident what their meaning and interpretation is. Where we, a lovely quote from Nate Silver that I use in, in my book, that, you know, he says, numbers do not speak for themselves, we imbue them with meaning. So the way in which we tell the story is absolutely vital. I've learned this because, although you know, I was a you know, proper card-carrying statistician, I suppose I still am, but um, for the last 10 years I've worked with social scientists, psychologists, communication professionals, and uh, in storytelling largely. And it's just made me realize the importance of narrative, of framing, of context, and so on. In, in fact, because numbers do have an, an emotional response, you know, or create a, an emotional response. And of course, people exploit that. They really do exploit that. They exploit that by manipulating the way numbers are presented. And I won't talk about Brexit now, but I will. I'm very happy to talk about that later. Um, and in particular relation to risks. And that very often, whenever I hear a risk mentioned in the news, whether it's about sausages or fracking, I usually know that someone is either trying to frighten me or reassure me, usually frighten me. And so I become uh, deeply suspicious because when numbers are used in that area, they're generally used, rather than informing us, they're used to persuade us. They're used as manipulative devices to make us feel differently and preferably to act differently, to do something, whether it's something noble like giving up smoking and, and uh, not drinking so much, or maybe it's something not so noble like trying to get us to vote in a particular direction. So it really annoys me when people have rather contemptuously talk about the public as being, oh, oh, people don't understand risk, you know, as if they're sort of stupid or something like that. I'd say, first of all, well, none of us understand risk especially you, whoever you are who claims that. And none of us do, because it's an immensely um, subtle and uh, you know, almost uh, you know, undefined concept. And the other thing is that generally the public is so unbelievably badly served by those in authority who want to present evidence to them, because those in authority are almost always trying to manipulate them to make them think something. They're not, very few people are trying to actually inform us about things. I, I, I think they're very, I could mention some, I think some of the fact-checking organisations, reality, full fact in particular, reality check on the BBC, I actually believe what they say, which is amazing. I actually do feel they are trying to tell us how it is, tell us the way things are. But it's unbelievably rare. And of course, you know, I, I, again, I won't go on to now, but you know, a classic way in, is to use relative risks rather than absolute risk to say, oh, if you eat this or something, it'll double your risk of breast cancer or double or increase your risk by 20%. And that is a known manipulative frame. It exaggerates the importance of effects. Well, because it doesn't tell us, well, double what? 20% of what? We need to know those absolute risks. Um, and I, I, I know I could come back to that later, I'm sure we will. And the other issue I think is interesting is that we can't always put risks into numbers. I know I, I like numbers, but sometimes we can't do it. And, and it's absolutely riveting, the, the fracking um, decision that was made yesterday based on the report 
from the Oil and Gas Authority, which I've now looked at, is, is extremely interesting because there they were getting sort of earthquakes around Blackpool or whatever, quite, you know, it's remarkably uh, strong ones. I was, I was surprised at that. And found that their models that were used to predict risk which just didn't work very well. And so I thought the communication of the reasoning behind um, this decision was quite good in that they said, well, we can't even, we don't even know what the risks are. We can't even put an idea of what the risks are in this context. So they've adopted this precautionary approach in, in uh, you know, halting at least temporarily or maybe permanently fracking. And I, I thought that was a, actually, I'd expected some really <coughs> bad reporting and manipulative reporting in this context. Actually, it wasn't, I didn't think it was too bad at all. So there's, there's lots of issues here, and, and sometimes one's surprised at the sophistication of the communication that is made. Um, it's important when we are receivers of risk number of risks or stories that we know where they come from. It's too easy to blame the journalists. Is something else. So I, I've now maybe I've gone a bit native because I do work with journalists quite a lot, um, and uh, and I, it's led me to, to understand that you know somebody does all this work, the scientists do the work, or someone does a survey, and then but when nobody sees that. You know, it's got to be then filtered through either the commissioners of the work or the publication process, the scientific publication process and we know what that, that introduces filters in terms of you know tending to publish a more noteworthy and positive studies but nobody sees that either because nobody reads the journals and the journalists don't either they have, then it's all passed through the press office who put the press release onto it and then it goes to the journalists and then it, we don't even see that it goes to go to the sub editors who stick some crap headline on it and then we eventually see it now, of course, that, and, and I, I got my, what I call the Groucho principle. The, the, after, you know, Groucho had this thing, is I wouldn't join any club that would have me as a member, which is a great paradox. I, I, the very fact, that is my version of that is the very fact that I'm hearing a risk story in the news is reason to disbelieve it. <laughs> because it wouldn't be there unless it was, you know, unless it was newsworthy and different and contradicted what somebody thought before and so on. And that means it's almost certainly wrong. So I think we should be deeply skeptical of the stuff we hear. But we do have to understand that, that pipeline of the way things you know, come. So uh, I, uh, the story, I, the one I use, which I would put up here, is that you know, recently there was a, a really tedious paper from Scandinavia which showed that uh, richer men got more brain tumours. And uh, the authors said uh, that probably an artefact. Uh, they did adjust, and uh, we, we know that older people, rich people lived longer and there's more chance for them to get brain tumors, but they corrected for that. But the author said, oh, it's probably an artifact, could well be an artifact because richer people have better health care, more likely to be diagnosed. But then the press office got hold of it and they thought, well, that's, you know, we want, we want to get some coverage. So they said that, um, well, you know, uh, people with higher levels of education get more brain tumors which wasn't what the story of the study was about, but never mind, it was an easier story. And then by the time we got to the Daily Mirror, and I could put up a headline in there, and the headline of the Daily Mirror was, why going to university increases the risk of getting a brain tube. <laughs> a beautiful headline, an absolute classic sub-editor headline, clickbait headline. So that's the whole process by which things occur. So just to finish off, the three questions then, that this leads me to ask about whenever I hear a risk story in the news. Um, the, and that's to do with trustworthiness. We could talk a bit about trust and trustworthiness later, I hope. First is, is the source trustworthy? And the crucial question with that is, why am I hearing this? Who wants me to know this? Because I, am not, I haven't gone out to find this. Someone is dumping this on me. There's a reason somebody wants me to see this. And a, a more difficult thing, of course, is to ask, what am I not being told? You know, like how many of these things were looked at before they presented me to this. And then to ask about the trustworthiness of the, of the number itself, the, clay, the, the evidence, is it good, is it based on good studies, and so on. And then finally, what is the trustworthiness of the claim that's based? In other words, when people say, oh, here's the evidence, and therefore you should do this, that, and the other. You know, in other words, what was the claim about the action that's relevant, that's appropriate after this story? And that can be a bear no resemblance sometimes to the evidence that's provided. And we could go back to that again. So finally, my final minute, I'll just say, ta-da! <laughs> it's my book. It's very good. It's very good. And, and it, it is good. It is good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah even I think it's good. I usually... <laughs> uh, um, my mum would think it was good if she was alive. But never mind. The point about the book is that it, it does, and we might come back to this later about when we talk about teaching statistics, is that generally, who's done stats courses? Who has done stats courses? Who thought they were really well taught and enjoyable? 
Oh, come on. You, I want one hand. Please, one. Oh, thank you. Yeah. But, you know, Are any of them your students? No, no, I shouldn't think. No, no, not. The stuff I teach is awful, this has been. So and I, I've done it really old-fashioned way. See the hands that dropped? No, this, you know, this is heartbreaking to someone who's, you know, worked in this area for 40 years or so and thinks it's, or 45 years, thinks it's incredibly important. So, and, but it's always what happens in that, you know, you just get taught all these techniques and tricks and formulas and tests and do your paired and unpaired, is it one tail, two tail, p value, all this nonsense. So, anyway, so uh, there's a new way of teaching stats, which this book embodies, which is to split the whole thing around, put pretty well the probability, probability in there isn't until chapter nine or something like that. But all that sort of mathematical, there's no maths in it either. You can teach an incredible amount of stats with no maths. That's what staggered me, how you don't need the maths to teach all the essential concepts, essentially. And, and instead, you put up front the important stuff, which is thinking about what data to use or what data is relevant. Or does it, can it answer my problem, my question? And when, having seen this data, can I conclude that X caused Y? And you don't need maths for the lot. You just need to be able to think about it and use common logic bits and common sense. What are the biases in this data? What are the problems? Why do random sampling? And all these are incredible issues to do with critiquing. Because actually, the people, I, the two people I know who are incredibly good at critiquing statistics are not statisticians. It's Michael Blastland, who's an English literature graduate who we work with and who's wrote a book with him. And actually, the other one I have to say who's extremely good is Christopher Snowden. You know, who's talking at a parallel session at the moment, who's, you know, has an extreme libertarian view to, to behavior and things like that. But God, is he good at tearing apart a stat story? He can really demolish them. So, um, and, so, so I don't, but don't go out and toy and listen to him. So, you know, stay, stay, I'm pleased you're here. So that's my, that's my bit, and I'm going to stop there and see what people have to say. Excellent. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. I have to say, I, I do seriously echo, this is a great book, and I genuinely do wish that I'd, I had been able to read it before staggering through a maths and stats degree, because you're right, coming at it the other way around is, is a much more intuitive way to do it. Uh, it's, and Chris Snowden will be delighted to hear endorsement <laughs> later. Uh, so, uh, Dan, could I, can I ask you first to, to come back with absolutely any, any thoughts you like, either directly related to what David was saying, or if you feel there's other things we should be talking about about risk? I'd, I'd say uh, that in, in the context of, of health and welfare, risks are obviously something that we all feel a bit of anxiety and, and concern about because it, it can affect us as, as individuals. But in any case, when, when it comes to how do we perceive risks and how do we understand these risks, it is then crucial in order for us to, to accept any uh, recommendations or guidelines on on changing the way we live our, our lives. It is, it is critical that this perception and understanding is correct, because without acceptance we, we would not be able to alter our behavior. And the whole purpose of communication on risk is to improve, in a way, our behavior. And that leads to, to the topic of, of trust, of, of what, where does this advice come from. Um, and, and I think that the, the truth is that people uh, hear a lot of contradictory information and, and therefore it's, there's confusion and there's less acceptance. So there are a lot of unintended consequences from um, communicating risk in a scaremongering way or uh, in, in inaccurate or overly emotional way. And I think there, there are questions on what to do about that and I've got a, a few of them and, and a couple of uh, suggestions on, on how to deal with that. And then, what I think it's, it's uh, a, a topic that, that I, I'm particularly interested in is how do we frame the risk? Because it, it's very difficult to find a, a fine line between black and white. And to find that acceptance that, that I was referring earlier, we, we need to look into the, the space between acceptable and unacceptable as tolerable. So what is tolerable? rather than what is the, the minimum uh, level that we, we can or we should accept risk at. And uh, if for any hazard that we, uh, we take, 
there, there is a, a damage. W what is the range of that damage? How, how broad is that? And how is that for us as individual? And then if we look at, at a society as a whole, uh, what can we deem as an acceptable risk for certain behaviors? And who is to decide about that? Is it one in 100? Is it one in 1,000? One in 10,000? Th these are questions that I think um, we can answer for ourselves. What, what is our level of tolerability? Uh, but we feel less uh, inclined to accept when uh, it's one, size, one, one hat size that, that fits all, all of us. Finally, on, on the issue of, uh, of trust and unintended consequences, I think uh, we'd be in a better place if we were able to demonstrate uh, at the, uh, after uh, we, we've issued uh, e uh, recommendations or, or guidelines on a, a number of things. For instance, how well the, the money were spent on, on that, or what was, uh, what was the policy a success or not? Have we measured it at all? And, and was that measurement um, adequate? Um, and then uh, did we manage to, to do a synthesis of all the evidence and then present it afterwards? What have we learned from that? And, and have we showed any empathy for unintended consequences uh, on, on that? And I think we, we don't see a lot of that, so we see a lot of contradictory facts, a, a lot of sometimes contradictory uh, messages, but we see less um, insight into what happened after we've done, or we, we maybe not of all of us have done what we were supposed to. So, Hilary, what thoughts do you have on risk? So, I thought what I would really like to do is pick up on some of the things that the other speakers have said and kind of perhaps situate them in, in perhaps a more political understanding of the world because. I think a really key point about risk is that, you know, if you go back uh, certainly a century or even 50 years, risk was, was a relatively neutral term, so there were good risks and bad risks. Um, and, and we are in a situation now where risk is almost always uh, a bad thing. Uh, it, it's, it's almost never uh, used in, in a positive way. Um, and, and that kind of tells you something about society. And that's not because the numbers have changed. Uh, you know, that is very much about uh, a, a cultural change. So that's, I think, the first thing that's important. The second thing, I think, is just around the way in which we understand and communicate risk. So uh, when we talk about probabilities, I kind of <coughs> almost yearn for the idea for the times when we just had a, a probability. So, you know, the chance of this is, you know, 20%, whatever. Um, because a, a single number like that is, is, is kind of easy to understand, but it does hide a lot. Uh, and certainly when we try to communicate risk now, we try to give people a better understanding of, of the kind of ranges of risk. So, you know, rather than have a number, you, you've got a, 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 a graph that shows you the, the way in which the, the, the risk is, is distributed. And once you start doing that, it is actually quite hard in a society where there is a kind of quite a negative uh, view of the future to stop people concentrating on tail risks. Uh, and I think that has happened, uh, certainly in a lot of areas, certainly in the area that I work in, in pensions. Uh, there's, a, there's an absolute concentration on, you know, worst case scenarios. And I'm sure you can think of other uh, examples that are perhaps in, in other areas that, that you're familiar with. And I do think that, that, that we, we have seen, as part, part of all that is, is, is very much a move away from what I would call, these are difficult words to say, uh, probabilistic risk to possibilistic risk, uh, where we don't just think about what is uh, likely to happen, but we think about the whole range of, of possible things that might happen. Now, that's quite an important change, because I think I would say probabilistic risk is something that's kind of rational, reasonable, measurable. Possibilistic risk is, is kind of almost existential angst. You never remove possibilistic risk. There is always uh, a risk uh, left out there. And, and it is the case that we, um, that tends to be interpreted in the, in the world that we live in now in a way where people do concentrate on those worst case scenarios. You know, the kind of culture of fear that develops 
is around concentrating not on what's likely to happen, but on what could happen. And I think you see that in some of the uh, political discussions that are happening uh, in the world today. So that was the first kind of bit of area I just wanted to explore a bit. The second area, if I've got time, yeah, yeah. is to just say a little bit about modelling. Because uh, certainly uh, uh, in the uh, sphere I work, we do, we spend a lot of time building models. Uh, and I'm one of the kind of, in our organisation, I'm one of the model sceptics. So I always try and break it. Because I think, you know, if you stochastically model risk, so you don't try to uh, uh, find a rational explanation of risk, what you do is you just throw data at it. So you throw 10,000 simulations at something within a model that you've built and see what the, the likely range of, of outcomes is. Now, when you do that, my critique is that it's never possible when you've got 10,000 simulations to examine those scenarios for plausibility. So if I say to, to one of my colleagues who brings one of their lovely graphs, you know, if, if I pick that point there, what has to happen in the real world for that scenario uh, to, to, come to uh, you know, uh, be the one that's played out? They can't explain that. You know, so it's, it's very much, a, well, the model says that. And I think being sceptical of models, I, I think is really, it's kind of a, a skill uh, that I would uh, urge you to um, develop, along with the three that, that, that David uh, mentioned uh, in his uh, introduction. Because I do think, you know, a lot of these things kind of pull us back to, uh, everybody uh, raises that um, quotation, don't they, people being fed up of experts. Uh, and, and I do think it's really important to pay attention to David's third point, which is around the numbers don't give you the answer. The answer to a problem is a political response. Uh, and the numbers, separating out the numbers from the political response is really, really important. Now, before I go out and give the audience a say, I wondered if there's anything you'd like to come back to. Oh, could to. I? Yeah, I quickly, mean, I mean, particularly, I, I, maybe not this, but just having read the book, I know that. There is quite a lot of use of stochastic modelling in it mm. as a, an intuitive way into understanding how mm. statistics mm. can show you things mm. in the real world. So, is that are you and Hillary about to have a fight over whether stochastic no, not, modelling no, is No, no, I'm useful? deeply sceptical as well. But I, I think the crucial thing is there's models and models, and so some models are extremely good. The ones I use, you know, just coin flipping models, or you know, in situations which we understand very well that a good model, um, which has been well calibrated in the past, and we know that what it says is reliable, can be incredibly valuable, because essentially the, these scenarios that it's generating are plausible. They're all ones that are essentially equally likely if it's doing some projecting into the future, and they are plausible, and there's a reason why each of them might happen. So, but the, the crucial is that just not all models are as good as that, and many are highly speculative. And, this, and, and the, the, what, you've got to be really wary. Oh, we built a model. Yeah, but hang on. How good is it? What is it? So I, I like star idea of star rating models. You know, you can have four-star models, like a roulette thing, where you know really well, well assuming people haven't fiddled it. And, um, but then you got down to the, the there's, again, in the fracking example, these were pretty crappy models. And they were shown not to predict well what was happening in, 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 in Preston. So they, 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 um, they had to admit it. They weren't very good models, so they tested them, and they're not very good, and they're unreliable for, made, for making future predictions. So I think there's models and models. So I'm not going to have a blanket thing. I do models all the time, but you have to know their reliability. We use models for predicting chances for people with, with cancer, how long they might live, 10 years, and they're pretty good because they're, they're like good actuarial models because people, nothing magic is going to happen to people. It's not, it's not like you can list the possibilities, well understood situations and they can work, but in more speculative areas we've got to be deeply cautious about them. And, that, and particularly, I think, this point about worst-case scenarios, which are hugely misunderstood. Now, I'm not a great fan, I have to admit, of, um, you know, of no-deal Brexit. But the, um, the, the, the way in which the reports that have been, were developed for no-deal Brexit, which specifically, because it is civil service guidelines to model worst-case scenarios, not that they, I, I, God, I get so annoyed because they never will define what worst-case means. I, you know, is it the 70% point or the 99% point? At least insurance, you know it's got to be the one in two 100% point, you know, they have defined what, what they, you should be looking at. 
So, um, you know, so what is it? But anyway, so these are the extreme cases, which by, by definition, the things that they're picking on are not very plausible, are very unlikely to happen. And yet these are then held up as being the predictions that are being made. So there's massive misuse of this worst case scenario business that something somebody says where suddenly it comes what they expect to happen, which is absolutely none. So, I mean, I, I think you should be doing, you know, obviously a, a sort of an expectation and some idea of what the range of possibilities is. But, um, and just to pick on one is completely hopeless. Just, to, just two quick points to Dan. First of all, the thing I really liked is this idea of, ex, of not just thinking of a threshold for risk. Uh, one threshold for risk is always disaster. I mean, you should never really you know, even bring it down, but if you're gonna have thresholds, you've gotta have two. You've gotta have something where below that it's acceptable, and then you have a high one where above that it's unacceptable. And in between, then we, you might call them tolerable or something like that. Now, the health and safety executive, bless them, you know, developed this 20, 30 years ago, I, th I think. It's, and it's been incredibly effective, amazingly effective to have two thresholds. And then if you're in the, uh, above the top level, you've got to do something about it. Below the bottom level, that's fine. In between, you should do what they call the LARP, as low as reasonably practicable. The, you know, take into account the trade-offs, you should be trying to reduce in that. And you know, you're from the drinks industry, um, you were very careful not to mention alcohol, but I'm happy to mention alcohol. And I've been arguing for ages that you need two thresholds for alcohol consumption. Because at the moment, the 14 units a week was estimated as something, right, right, the, the basis of that was a one in 100 chance, if you had that, one in 100 chance the drink could kill you. So that's what it was based on. And you know they tried to model that. You know, where you can complain about the models, maybe, but it was based on the explicit. They call it low risk. I'd say that's an acceptable risk to people. You know that's the acceptable risk. But well, and they've traditionally also had an unacceptable risk, which is 35 units for women, um, 50 units for men a week, which was then about one in one in six, one in seven chance it would kill you. They estimate, and that was be considered as unacceptable. And in between that range between, you know, a couple of small drinks a day and a pretty well, not got a bottle of wine a day, nine, a little bit less than a bottle of wine a day. In between there, that was the reason, the area which you should be trying to reduce as an aspirational target. And I, th I think that's, I, don't, I think people could accept that, but I've argued that because I've been blue in the bloody face and no one's ever taken the slight bit of, bit of notice. The one thing I would disagree with you on, <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to wag my finger. It's horrible. I don't, okay, um, is that I don't think the whole purpose is, be, is to change, improve behaviour. Um, we are centre explicitly has got as our strap line to inform and not persuade. We don't want to change. We're, I'm not trying to change behaviour in anything we do in all our communication. But we are not trying to change behaviour. We're trying to improve, empower people to make more informed decisions, and so improve the quality of the decision making. If they then decide to do something, you know, whatever they decide to do, it's just fine, provided it's a well-informed decision that's congruent with their values and the evidence and so on. So I would say, I mean, I also have worked in behavior change units, so I'm not saying it's wrong to try to change behavior, I just say that that is not, for me, the prime reason to communicate risks. Would, you, would either of you like to say anything back before I bring the audience in? Policies or, or guidelines are trying to the to guidelines change. are so yes, the statistics that's true. in yeah. themselves yeah. they 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 are informative and, and the narrative yeah. be, behind statistics is critical yeah. to, for people to understand what is all about and and to, to be able to calibrate and to position themselves on that range of yep. tolerability mm -hmm. that works for them with their lifestyle and in conjunction with the other risks mm -hmm. that people take because we take lots of risks um, mm -hmm in our lives. So, so yeah, totally agree that, that mostly regulation would persuade and um, risk information would provide that information. And that information needs to be as accurate as possible. And what, what the, the point I made is that the, the accuracy is not only when, when it comes to the, the input of, of that um, information or risk, but also what happens afterwards. Uh, in, in terms of how we change that behavior. That, that insight, the post-communication insight is equally crucial. So people, so first of all, we, we, we can make better uh, regulation, tell better stories next time, but also to, to uh, assess how, how uh, have we managed to influence the behavior of most people which were at the highest risk. 
um, to start with. Hilary, do you want to chip in? Yeah, I just wanted to work my finger back, just on oh, the use sorry. of one word, which yeah. is the use of the word prediction. And I, I think when you're doing modelling, I always really uh, hammer down people say prediction because they're projections rather than predictions of the future. So I just think it's quite important, it might seem kind of too critical, but I do think it's quite important that, that you know, these are not, these are, are not predictions. The other thing, just in terms of that exchange between you two there, was just this issue about risk consciousness and its effect on behaviour. Because I think whether you want it to or not, making people risk conscious does affect behaviour. Um, and we can, you know, we can see, for example, other sessions in, in the uh, Battle of Ideas have talked about things like, for example, uh, the effect on our, our attitude to children, the idea of, you know, kind of uh, cotton wool kids, even though our, our children are safer than ever. And, and, and making people very risk conscious, you, you can't do that and then say people's behaviour won't change because it does change. It's about um, fracking. So I had a very interesting discussion about fracking and so the, the, the question is really about what's it got to do with the risk anyway. So the question is about fracking and how it's portrayed in the, in the left-leaning media, The Guardian, and the right-leaning media. So the fracking debate in the left-leaning media was in the environmental section. So people who read that, if this is an environmental issue, and it probably reinforces what they already believe, people in the Telegraph, it was in the economic section, i.e. it's about the economic power of the country, it probably reinforces what, what, what they already believe. And it kind of reminds me of being in some of the debates yesterday about the establishment, about popularism. I don't think anybody walked out of those debates with anything other than reinforcing what they, what they already believed about uh, whether Brexit's a good thing, bad thing, or an indifferent thing. So it strikes me that risk is at best spurious in the argument. It's just about you know your you, what you're bringing to the party already, and then your emotional reaction <coughs> to what what is what is being presented to you. Um, secondly, about um, unlikely events or worst case scenarios. So I don't know what your opinions are on black swan events. So this is I think you probably all know this, but for example, 9/11 was a black swan event, and so no one knows a black swan exists until you see a black swan. And no one knew that a, an aeroplane could be used in order to detonate a building until it, was, until it was used to detonate a building. So a lot of risk work nowadays is, as you've touched on, focused on what's the, what's the Black Swan event that we haven't yet considered. So do you think that is an interesting debate to have intellectually and it might lead to something interesting at the end of it? Or is it just a lot of, um, lot of hot air being sort of spouted by people sitting around a table? Kind of connected, and it's just picking up on something that uh, David was raising about uh, about Brexit. So I think we have an issue here where um, a number of financial projections, predictions, depends how it's represented in the media, uh, are being made about the um, economic implications of what happens, and um, people who uh, disagree with those particular projections or predictions. Uh, will actually start to question the modelling, the assumptions that underpin the modelling. Uh, and then the press picks things up and then we develop a whole lot of, I think, fear around potentially what might be happening. So my question really is around what can we do to not undermine the value of the modelling that's been done, but to be more transparent about how the projections have actually uh, arisen such that the public can be more informed about what's going on and, and uh, what do we do about managing the press who's after a great story <laughs> who are an additional stakeholder in order to manage that because potentially I think statistics are being used for um, fear mongering and political ends which is not really helping anybody at the end of the day. Do you need to know a lot about a subject before you can actually make sense of the statistics? The reason I say that is that one of my activities I chair is called Transport Statistics Users Group, and they said, oh, could you organise a set on energy statistics? So I tried to understand a bit about them for asking people. But it's actually really complicated, because are you talking about raw energy? Are you talking about used energy? You, know, you might use um, you know, 500 kilowatt hours, but of course, 
got the flow energy coming in. Like, something's quite interesting. Uh, Eurostar said we, we're really efficient. Why are they efficient? Oh, because they assume they use all French nuclear energy, which of course produces no CO2. And, and so it goes on. And there are lots and lo lots of factors like this. And I thought, this is okay. I could probably do it, because I know a bit about energy. I can work out the difference between private sector. When it comes to, say, social, if you're talking about, say, um, prisoner reoffending, I haven't clue what to think, because I know nothing about, about prisoner or whatever. So people are producing statistics. I think, can I, I, am I even in a position to understand statistics or something that I, I don't know anything about? It's like someone saying, could you look at um, logistics? Through logistics, there's the, if, if you're buying something, well, you've got the shipping, you've then got to get it from lorry to the supermarket, and then the car driving there, what have you, which I think a rough evil or, or whatever. Looking at that, it, it is really complicated. I said, I don't really know where to stand. The bloke said, you work for an organisation that's done a report on that. And I said, no, it's not part of the organisation, or, or whatever. But are we in a position to understand statistics? Building one model is very difficult, but a lot of the big decisions are based on multiple models feeding into each other, like in economics or climate. So if one of the models is wrong, then basically everything is wrong. Um, uh, one model which has been had a lot of teasing in recent years is the IEA, which is the International Energy Authority, uh, doing the solar predictions about how, grow, how far solar power will grow in future years. I was just wondering if you'd ever come across that graph and if you had any comments on it. Um, so you've talked a bit about uh, questioning models and uh, uh, questioning what their uh, projections or predictions are based on. Um, but we don't, or I don't think I very often hear of models being how to account, apart from the fracking one, I think might be the only um, a, a prominent example that I've heard of. So do we think that statistician should also be part of that holding uh, projections to account if someone says if we continue down this path this will happen? Uh, in, you know, someone, that statistician should also be part of looking backwards as well as looking forwards. There's a number of statistics uh, put about with respect to the risk of having a Conservative <coughs> government. Uh, so I was wondering what the panel thought about them. So there's um, the number living in poverty, when poverty is defined as 6% of average national income, which, which uh, turned out to be around about £20,000. Which in Manchester, where I come from, it's possible to have a, an average kind of life, but obviously that might be different down in London. Um, and then the idea that austerity has caused 30,000 extra deaths, um, which apparently is the norm for um, the excess that occurs during the winter months. So um, I was wondering how those figures had been put together and uh, what the panel thought about it. The austerity causing extra deaths, uh, I actually looked at partly in a radio programme about life expectancy, I went out mm. in September, for which yes, we interviewed Hillary. Uh, she showed me a lovely graph that, saying that I would live for 90 years, roughly, and then said it didn't apply to me because I'm not part of a pension scheme. Uh, <laughs> but then more or less also, in fact, <coughs> looked very specifically at that, that claim about austerity causing extra deaths um, in some detail. So if you're interested, I, I recommend that. Uh, so three things I wanted to come back on. One is just around, is, is it helpful to look at worst-case scenarios? Mm. And, and I think, politically, it, it can be really problematic because there's, there's almost a kind of feedback loop where concentrating on worst-case scenarios kind of sensitises the popular imagination to worst-case thinking, which then means that that's the thing that people concentrate on. And, and you know, that does mean in people's heads that what can happen becomes, in their view, what is likely to happen. But the second thing is just on holding models to account, because one of the real problems uh, we, we find um, quite often <coughs> is that a lot of the data that you need to throw at a model to make it work is kind of held privately, uh, and organisations see that as their intellectual property, uh, and they really don't like either disclosing that data or disclosing the basis on which that data has been uh, collected or produced. And that is one of the real problems about, about holding some of these models to account. I don't know, we've got any USS members in the audience? Because That's the university's pension schemes. University superannuation schemes. You know, one of the real uh, issues around the, the current um, uh, dispute around USS is that it is actually very hard to test some of the stuff that uh, the pension scheme is claiming uh, as 
uh, the one of the parts of the rationale uh, for their uh, wanting more, more money in it because you know a lot of that rationale does depend on models and they are unwilling or, or potentially unable because of you know the, the producers of the raw data for the, the, those models to, to be um, explicit and to be public about uh, the rationale for those models. So, you know, I do think it, it is important to hold mod models to account, but I think the kind of privatisation of data, people always quote GDPR. It's almost never GDPR because it's anonymised data. Uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of privatisation of, of data, I think, is a real problem and, uh, and one that, that, you know, we should be uh, uh, c campaigning around. Finally, just on this uh, austerity causing uh, extra deaths, I mean, it, Mortality is, is obviously one of my uh, fields of expertise. Uh, interestingly, in the last quarter has seen the biggest rise in li life expectancy, so the biggest fall in mortality uh, that we've seen for, for a long time. Uh, it's very, very difficult to unpick mortality data. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I think some of those claims I would be uh, fairly sceptical of. What I'd say on, on statistics like the austerity, and I think, you know, just <clears throat> one piece of, of information which which is dry and, and doesn't give us a lot of uh, a lot of clue you know so austerity between what period and what you know what 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 does that mean and austerity for whom and so yes it, it, it's a national figure so obviously it, it adds up a number of probably and hopefully um, well informed uh, calculations there but if the purpose of, of of this statistic is just to to put a big headline and 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 sell w without necessarily having a, a so what is um, is in a way problematic. What what I think is is more important is to put things into the context that makes sense for for people at a more individual level, um, and and that people can make more uh, more informed decisions about um, about their own choices. Uh, and sensationalist headlines from uh, about things that, that are forced upon us without our ability to react, or, or at least react immediately, can leave us with, um, with a, a big shrug that, okay, so, so what, what, what should I do? What should, should we do about it? And what can I, what, what's the, the answer? What, what is the, the antidote to, to all that? And very interesting the way, you know, the questions have focused on, you know, the trustworthiness of modelling and everything, which isn't something that normally people come up with. So it shows this is a very different audience to the, to the usual mob I talk to. So, uh, the, the, and, uh, and there's really riveting, so, so many of the questions are to do with it. You know, can they adequately deal with, with black swan type, you know, events that have never happened before? You know, almost by definition, that was likely to be left out of the model that you've got. You know, can you do people look back and check that they've been reasonable? You know, what happens when they put them all together? And it's all to do with the trustworthiness of modelling. And I think I'd like to make an analogy here with uh, with what's the discussion that's going on around use of AI and algorithms in terms of decisions on our behalf, whether it's healthcare or recidivism or even whether you get a loan or not and things like that, which is now coming under increasing scrutiny as to, you know, just where do these numbers, where does this come from? And I, I, I think in both situations, the algorithm that pops out something and we have to say, oh, the computer says that, you know, and, and, and we just have to, oh, all right then. Um, and, and a model that's coming up with stuff, the, the same questions need to be asked. It needs to have a degree of trustworthiness. And that means being able to explain why it's come to its conclusions. And uh, I think it's absolutely vital that that's taken on board, both in the AI algorithm field and in general statistical modeling, that we can't get away with the model says X. This is just outrageous. It needs to be able to explain where it came from, why does the model say yes? What if we'd put in something else? You need all the counterfactuals, you need all the what if statements. What's the range of possibilities? What's more likely, what's less likely? To try to get away from this ridiculous idea of, as you said, confusing worst case things with expectations and all, the, all that sort of stuff. So, and it, we are unbelievably ill served by the way these things are communicated because everyone communicating them is trying to make us feel something, usually trying to make us frightened. And as I said, there's the, the, 
you know, Brexit modelling, where's the agency that will, you know, actually deliver in a balanced way? You know, possibly the Institute of Fiscal Studies, I suppose, and maybe full fact. But, you know, in the referendum, the Remain, the government Remain camp, we're saying, oh, every family's going to lose 4,000 a year, but from the big red blue poster that was in there. I mean, it's not as bad as the 350 million quid on the side of the bus, but never mind. That 4,000 a year is a deeply spurious number. It's based on a treasury model, a projection, assuming a 7% reduction in GDP, or over what GDP would have been, um, and with some, they had some uncertainty around that 7%, but again, it's massively assumption-driven, and the, the, the amount of change in GDP divided by the number of families is not what every family loses. That's not... That's not how you know the GDP is defined. So this is a deeply spurious number that was what was being paraded out. Do you think we need? Do you think we should have a warning sign the way that some foods uh, are supposed to have stickers on saying this contains X? That when numbers in headlines actually come from a model rather than from a study of the real world, we should have a sticker on saying this number comes from a model which includes these assumptions. Almost no numbers come from the real world. You know, almost no numbers are direct measures from the real world. All of them, almost all of them have been adjusted for something, have been tweaked, have been at least, you know, seasonally adjusted and changed and things like that. Almost nothing is a direct count from the real world. I can hear the sound of illusion shattering throughout yeah. the audience. Uh, OK, so I'm going to uh, come back out. We have about 20 minutes left, so I'm, I'm going to try and get everybody else's thoughts. On the subject of climate change, should and trusting for the, credit, the credibility of the sources of the data, um, should we trust the scientific community? Should we trust the supranational and national organisations like the UN, the Bank of England, and many other um, financial institutions that are now speaking very loudly about climate change, because it strikes me that we probably should, but there are many, many, and very, some very prominent uh, skeptics. Um, so that's the first question. Um, and then related to that is that it strikes me also that the reason that people are becoming a bit more possibilistic rather than probabilistic is because some of these deemed extremely rare events, and climate change gives us some great examples here, are becoming much less rare. So to give some examples, Houston in 2017 was, it, it experienced three 500 year storms in one year. Um, and we're seeing more and more extreme weather events in California with the wildfires or many others. So that I suspect is not a good reason to be possibilistic, but maybe why we're turning in that direction. Two quick questions, very quick. Number one, do politicians tend to take their statistics from experts or from headlines or both? And number two, there's the old joke, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. How do we bring statistics back into good order? I think a lot depends upon at what stage somebody wants to look at statistics and what, you know, what is the purpose for looking at statistics or modeling. If people have already made their mind up, and if they're then looking for statistics to try and back yeah, up, yeah. then there's no point. You, you, could, you could give them whatever stats you want. They're only going to believe what they want to believe. Yeah, yeah. And I think so, for example, if there's a, if somebody comes up with a statistic, a politician from those statistics saying that after Brexit, the standard of living, everybody's going to go down by 10%, uh, people go, bloody remain there. But if it's actually, it's Nigel Farage who said that. They go, oh, actually, hang on a minute. You know. So I think it's... it's People come to it from, uh, once they've got a fixed mind, there's no point looking at statistical modeling, it's a waste of time. So I think it's, it's, you've got to approach it with an open mind with a view to being able to adapt and change or use, or, or change the, your, your perception. Otherwise, there's no point uh, resorting to statistics or, or risk analysis. You know when you said um, risk has changed from a neutral term to a negative term? Is that because we're more risk averse or is it just because we're like you, every time risk is talked about, it's like in a negative way. And like, what's the consequence of that for the morals of society and how they feel about the future and the present? So I mean, the decision against uh, fracking is supposedly based on scientific evidence. But when I hear the phrase precautionary principle, I believe that actually re relocates it to the political sphere. This has to be precautionary against what? You know, a chimney falling off in... in um, Blackpool versus interruption of gas supplies from Norway versus a tsunami coming up the Bristol Channel and swamping uh, Hinkley Point. 
Um, so I wonder if actually the, the real risk is, is uh, how Warrington Man is going to vote in the, in the coming election, <laughs> maybe. I was just thinking with the election coming up soon, I have a feeling we're going to be bombarded with a number of statistics that are designed just for political gain and how, I was wondering if the panel could kind of give advice on how to wade through the chaff that we're going to be presented with to find uh, the corn, because I just have no idea. So I have actually experienced an excellent postgraduate medical stats course, probably because I wrote it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just a quick defense of modeling, I think that um, Modelers are the first people to understand the assumptions and yeah, the risks yeah. of using models. Yeah. And I think that completely disregarding them on that basis is quite dangerous because they can be very useful. Yeah. And secondly, um, I was wondering what we can do about the depoliticization of risk and false statistics. So, for example, one off the top of my head is this statistic that 40% of young so called transgender kids will attempt suicide which is based on a very spurious survey. In fact, it's, um, it's not even, I don't think it's even a proper yeah, survey. Yeah. And yet they're using these figures to kind yeah, of scare yeah. other parents. How can we deal with this kind of politicization? It's just a really quick question maybe for David um, about um, political polling itself and election forecasting, um, because um, quite a few of those in recent years seem to have been wrong. So I was wondering if there was any particular reason um, for that with that just a mysterious thing in general we could um, say about why that's happened. The issue of, of trust in um, uh, the United Nations or, or institu in uh, b big name institutions, I think in, <coughs> it, it, it's not that important um, how big the name is, but how successful and consistent and sustainable is the, the information that, that they convey in, to, to generate that, that trust. And I think to generate that trust, they, they, they really need to present the cost and benefits because it, it seems that very often we are only um, presented with the cost of, of uh, hazards or, or cost of, of our own actions uh, w without being presented with the benefits as well. And those cost and benefits are different for different groups. So just by pulling everybody in the same uh, pot, I think I think it, it generates this sense of ah, can't be can't be true because it really doesn't apply to me. So I think this targeting of, of message would be much more useful um, to, to different groups. So I now talk about drink driving to drivers. Uh, or you know this, this is obviously a clear way of, of, of targeting, but it's more about you know, how, how, how do different groups of people act, tend to act, and, and how do they also perceive risk? That you, you, the level of, uh, of noise that you make it may, may be different. Because the, if people perceive that decision is, is fair and inadequate, they, is, that's mistrust and that's rejection, and, and that's the opposite uh, effect, and that's a waste of resources at a time when, when we need those resources. So uh, if we constantly show disregard to benefits and we constantly uh, tend to ignore certain people that may have a voice in the, in the debate on risk management, then obviously the uh, effect of alienation uh, happens. And, and that's probably linked to the point on politicians where they take the, their information from scientists or from headlines. So it should be a bit of both, but more than that from other places as well. Um, and, and that's the, the thing that the, the more you open the, the conversation on what is risk, uh, how, how can that be managed and who should pick up which bit in terms of managing it, I think the better everything uh, can work out in terms of how that narrative is built and how is that narrative directed to different groups of people that are affected differently by risk. And then they can take that information and act for their own good or, or their community good uh, in a better way. And also understand that from all policy or regulation, there are winners and losers. So not only cost and benefits, but winners and losers. And make, that, make it that clear that, you know, if this is the risk and, and these are cost and benefits, but there are also winners and losers so that people can have that clarity. And lastly, the, the one thing which, which I 
I, I want to, to bring on um, in a call to action form is that it would be great in term, when we refer to health and well-being uh, to have possibly a, a broader church, a multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder group that would have a, a role in contributing to the way risk is determined, risk is presented, and informing uh, the decision-making uh, people and institutions so, so that when that information gets to, to the public is much more meaningful and actionable. A, there was a couple of questions about um, possibilistic risk and the, the kind of uh, attitudes to the future. So I think there's, there's two issues to this. One is the kind of political issues and one is the um, technical issues. So I think if, without going through the whole history of the last century, I think, you know, if you, if you do wind history back and think about what was happening in the kind of late 80s and 90s, you had for the Berlin Wall, the idea that there was no alternative political uh, response to the world. You had the idea of Tina, there's no alternative to the market. And, and if you think about some of the phrases that were coming out around things like unknown unknowns, uh, about the butterfly effect, I think all those things, when you take all those things together, kind of reinforce this idea that we lack the knowledge to understand the world uh, and we lack the knowledge to act on the world in a way that makes it better and I think what but what those things say is that you you know in that kind of a, a scenario you really shouldn't rely on probabilities you know you should start looking at possibilities and, and I think that's part of the the shift in politically to possibilistic risk I think technically you know, when I first started uh, studying mortality, when I first started as a youngster in, the, uh, in an insurance company, we just had calculators, right? We didn't have computers at all. Uh, so I think, you know, we weren't, we weren't capable of doing the kind of modelling that we, we can do now. So I think, you know, the, we, we can do uh, so much more now. So I think you've got to uh, put, put that into the, uh, the, the, the mix as well. All these issues around, you know, how do you wade through the chaff? I think I'm, I'm almost minded to go back to David's point that I just don't believe any of it. Um, <laughs> but, but certainly take a sceptical uh, approach to it. You know, I mean, on the climate change, I think it, it's really difficult to, to, to uh, challenge any of the climate change stuff with, without just being, have the term denier thrown at you. Uh, but I think it is right to be sceptical and to read widely uh, different uh, writers, and not just to read the IPCC stuff on its own. Um, because, you know, the, the, uh, you don't have to be a denier to say that there are different responses to the climate change effects uh, that, that we are seeing. So, uh, so David, yeah. what, what would you like oh, to... Oh, I don't know, there's so like, much I'd love to... you can give any practical hands Oh, OK, advice, it's very difficult. There's so much that I could respond to. Just quickly on the polls, um, they've been getting much worse because um, based on telephone interviews, you get a very low response rate. They're not very reliable at all. I, what I do recommend is looking at the, the um, BBC poll tracker because it will plot a line, but it'll actually show the results of the individual polls and their variability is about twice their claimed margin of error. So they cannot be right. Their margins of error are hopelessly low. So th I think that's, that's just that's a very good way to look at it. And don't believe the claimed margins of error. Actually, just look at the spread of polls. That's the right way to do it. Um, and it, but there are some better techniques that are being developed for this. I think, I think this really interesting thing is about you know, we're getting onto the misinformation. How can we empower people to question all the stuff that's going to be bandied around the election increasingly? And I, I'm not so depressed about, I'm, I don't feel that, you know, you know, some people have made up their minds and unchangeable. But I think, you know, the work of Hans Rosling, you know, I'm sure many of you know, you know, has really shown that just presenting people with surprising facts in a good, vivid way, telling a great story, really can change people's perception of the world. It's changed my perception of it. I, I am, I realise, I actually am influenced by statistics, even the ones I don't particularly like, and they, they um, you know, change my mind about things. Um, so I think we do need to challenge all the time. One of the big failures of things like the Today programme is that the, the people who do the interviews are incapable of challenging a statistic. They don't know where it came from. Why don't they just say, where did this number come from? How do you know? And the problem is they don't want to ask that. Partly, you know, the person almost certainly doesn't know where it came from, but they neither does the interviewer either. So that's one of the problems. 
Um, and, and I think we've got to really respect the fact checkers, you know, things like more or less, or whatever, you know, the journalists who will actually call out claims. And we've got to be much more, we ought to be teaching it in schools, about critiquing claims. As I said, the crucial one, I think, I've, I've moved to the top of my priority, really, is what is the motivation of the person telling me that. And maybe that's just a bit mean. I, I did used to have as the first one, can you believe the number? Can you believe the claim? Can you believe the source? But now I've moved the source up to the top as the very first thing you should ask is why am I hearing this, which is maybe, to, you know, shows my old man scepticism. But basically, there are those three things. You know, what is the actual, for the actual number, what is the evidence that's based on? Is that reliable? And then, and then is the conclusion, the claim, the recommendation on the base of it, does it follow from the evidence or what else is being brought in there? And then, and thirdly, this business of having deep scepticism about the source and about what am I not hearing? You know, is this just based on selective evidence? Has he just pick, cherry picked the stuff that will essentially deliver an argument where they've already decided? And it's uh, terrifying how often that occurs, even in scientific papers. So um, I think those are basic, three basic questions that everyone can be taught, not just journalists. School kids can be taught. And maybe it might mean they pause slightly before pushing the share or like button. <laughs> Please thank our three panellists and indeed yourselves for really excellent.